Okay, so this is lecture 23. It's going to be uh, sort of the first in a new small unit. Now that we're done with uh, CSPs and linear programs and so forth, we're going to talk about communication complexity and uh, information uh, theory and maybe some learning theory. Uh, but today's we're going to start with communication complexity. So this is a great topic. Um, there's two books I can recommend. The first one is the super classic book by Kushalovitz and Nissan. That's uh, you know, a real classic. It's been around for a really long time. Uh, on the other hand, there's a really, really new book by uh, two experts, Anup Rao and uh, Amir Yehudaya, uh, that you can uh, check out now. So uh, communication complexity is a really beautiful, um, really an abstraction, an abstract sort of model for computation uh, that has uh, tremendous use throughout computer science theory. It infiltrates into almost all branches of it, but I just listed three particular areas that it's used a lot, and they're all kind of in algorithms areas, uh, namely the study of data structures, of uh, the bounds and the size of uh, linear programming relaxations, and in streaming algorithm, but really this is just three out of many, many, many possible application areas of communication complexity. Okay, so we actually already talked about communication complexity once in this course in lecture 10, where we uh, briefly showed uh, an, um, an application of univariate polynomials uh, in communication complexity to determining the two-party communication complexity of the equality function. I'll remind you what the, those things mean as we go along. But in fact, let me just set up here the uh, basic model of two-party communication complexity. And I should add that um, there are extensions of this model to multi-party communication complexity, and uh, usually proving theorems in the multi-party setting is much, much harder. So we're only going to talk about two-party communication complexity in this lecture. Okay, so our two parties are, as always, named Alice and Bob, and uh, they are co cooperating to jointly solve a task, and the task they want to solve is to compute a function, f, mapping a pair of inputs, x and y, into an output, z. So they both know this function f, they're both thinking about it in their minds. And uh, usually, and I think almost exclusively in this lecture, the sets capital X and Y will be the set of n bit strings, and uh, z will be the uh, set of bits. So uh, Alice and Bob will be trying to compute a function that takes two n bit strings and outputs a single bit. And uh, they can make plans beforehand on how they're gonna you know, achieve this, but when it comes to actually doing this computation, uh, they're going to be physically separated. You imagine they're uh, physically separated from one another, but they can communicate. They have some channel of communication between them. And when the story begins, uh, Alice gets her own private input, x. We got a pen out here. Little x, a subset of big x. So I, I almost always think of this as uh, little x as an n-bit string. And Bob gets his own n-bit string. And now their goal in life is to try to compute f of little x and little y. And what they can do is send messages to each other so they can communicate back and forth. And their final goal is for them to both know the correct value of little f applied to their private inputs, x and y. And as the name communication complexity suggests, um, well, I didn't write it here. Maybe I'm missing something on a slide, but uh, I think I'm missing a bit of my slide. The point is that, um, the only thing that we charge for against Alice and Bob is how much computation they do, or sorry, how much communication they do. Uh, conversely, uh, they're not charged at all for how much computation they do. So they can do, you know, computationally speaking, on their own time as much as, you know, as complicated a complica uh, computation as they want. Uh, we only charge them for the uh, communication that they perform. Okay, so we can assume sort of without loss of generality that whenever they communicate a bit to each other, uh, a message to each other, it's one bit long. So these yellow arrows represent one-bit communications, and they need not alternate either, as we'll see. Okay, so let's do some examples. Um, the first example is the one that we talked about in lecture 10, where f is the equality function. So Alice and Bob both have their own private n-bit string, and they're trying to determine if these two strings are identical or not. And uh, deterministically, and uh, I say this only because we're going to shortly make a distinction between uh, deterministic communication algorithms and randomized communication algorithms. But deterministically, um, n plus one bits uh, suffice and are also necessary. So in fact, whenever Alice and Bob uh, have n bit strings in their inputs, n plus, and the output is a single bit, as in this case, um, n plus one bits of communication always suffice because there's a very trivial thing they can do. Alice can simply 
tell her entire string x to Bob. That's n bits of communication. And now Bob knows both little x and little y. He can compute f of little x, little y. Doesn't matter you know, how complicated that computation is, so he can get the answer. And now he knows the single bit answer, and then he just has to send this bit back to Alice. OK, so that's n plus 1 bits of communication suffice for any function like this, mapping uh, two n-bit strings to a single bit. And uh, the point is that uh, it's going to be not too hard to show that, in fact, this is uh, necessary uh, for computing the equality function. Okay. I should mention also that, or remind you also that, like, um, you know, Alice and Bob are really cooperating here. There's no issue of, like, distrust or anything like this or privacy. They're really trying to do their best. The only thing they're worrying about is uh, how many bits they communicate. So it uh, looks like nothing too trivial can be done in the case of equality. But as we saw in lecture 10, if you admit randomization, if you allow randomized uh, communication algorithms, then actually there's something dramatically better. Actually, there's a communication algorithm, a randomized communication protocol that uses only order log n bits. And it gets the correct answer with high probability for every pair of inputs, little x and y. So I just want to stress that like in this uh, situation, little x and little y are not random strings or anything. This randomized algorithm that we saw, and I'll mention, well, a different way to do this in this lecture. Um, it works literally for any pair of strings x and y, even if you know, x and y only differ by a single bit. Then this log n uh, bit communication probability protocol still detects that they're different um, you know, with high probability. Uh, OK, I have a question. Uh, the question is, what is the motivation for setting up communication as computing a common function? as opposed to sending a message, for instance. Yeah, so um, let me first start off by saying that, uh, OK, this is a good point. Um, right, so first let me start off by saying that uh, one thing we're assuming here is like a perfect channel. There's no noise or anything. So we're working uh, not in the setting, let's say, coding theory. Uh, that's fine. Um, we are also not yet working in the setting where uh, maybe Alice has like a random input. So far, we're only considering worst case inputs. And so um, you're right. The question is right that like even if like a task is sort of simpler, like Alice wants to transmit a string x to Bob, uh, this task sort of only becomes maybe interestingly non-trivial if you imagine a probability distribution over inputs x that Alice might want to transmit as we will in fact do in the next lecture when we talk about um, information theory. But in this lecture where we don't have such a distribution, well, uh, you know, the task of Alice, you know, sending an n-bit message to Bob, I mean, there's not much to say about it. It requires n bits of communication and, you know, randomized or not, that's all you can say. So um, that's why in this setting, you know, the more interesting task is that Alice and Bob are sort of jointly trying to compute some function. Um, but their inputs are separated. OK, here's another example. Uh, you can think about it as I talk um, the communication complexity of it. So this is the, when the function f is what I call parity sub 2n. Here, Alice and Bob both get an n-bit string. And they want to compute the overall parity, or overall XOR, of all n bits of their shared input. So I wonder if somebody can type into the chat the uh, communication complexity of this task. I should think about it for a moment. Two, that's right. Uh, very good. As someone said, it's two bits. Um, so this is an example where actually parity is quite a non-trivial function for some models of computation. As we mentioned at some point, for example, it's quite hard to compute by constant depth circuits. Uh, but in communication, it's quite easy, basically because Addition mod two is commutative. Uh, the point is that you know Alice can first privately compute the parity of her n bits. Bob can privately compute the parity of his n bits. Then they both have reduced down to one bit, and the only thing they needed to do is compute the parity or XOR of these two bits. So Alice can send that one bit to Bob. He can compute the parity and send it back, or they can just exchange their single bits and figure it out. Uh, here's another interesting example that you can also think about as I'm chatting. Um, so here. You can always think of an n-bit string as a subset of the numbers 1 through n. That's what I mean here by brackets n. And so in this problem, which is the median problem, uh, Alice and Bob both get subsets of numbers from 1 through n. 
And uh, here we have like my one example where the output, the thing they're trying to compute is not just a single bit. Here they're trying to compute, the, well, basically a log n bit quantity, namely the median of the union of their two sets. Okay, and um, you know, let's say the multiset union and uh, make some suitable definition if this union is of even cardinality. So uh, it's a pretty non-trivial example. I wonder if you can uh, suggest how many bits of communication you think you need to do this task, or conversely, you know, what's an amount of communication that's sufficient to do this task? N is one suggestion. So uh, yeah, this is a task again where you can always basically do it with N or maybe n plus log n, because Alice can send her entire set to Bob, which is an n-bit string, basically, or n bits. Bob can do all the computations, figure out the median, and then he can, let's say, tell the median to Alice. That takes log n bits. But you can do better than that. Log n squared is some suggestion I have. That's exactly right. You can do this with order log squared n bits. And I won't... Um, give 100% of the details on how, but the basic idea is to use binary search. Okay, so um, uh, you can maybe try to binary search for the median and, you know, to answer, you know, your binary searching between n possibilities and to answer, you know, a question of should, you know, Alice and Bob collectively take a look to the left or the right of like a current candidate for a median, they basically need to know how many, um, numbers in their set union, A union B, are to, let's say, are smaller than this current potential median. And here again, they can use a little bit of commutativity, like, you know, Alice can count how many numbers in her set A are less than this potential median. Bob can count how many numbers in his set B are less than this potential median. They can share that information, which is like order log n bits, and thereby understand if they need to, like, you know, when doing their binary search, you know, move the new candidate median, like, halfway to the left in the interval or halfway to the right. Okay, so it's sort of like log n rounds of communication, each round costing them order log n bits. And this is a nice example that really um, illustrates the need for like interaction and multiple rounds. So uh, some of these examples up here, including if you remember the randomized algorithm for um, quality testing, they're basically only involve one-way communication where like Alice sends a bunch of stuff to Bob and Bob does a computation and maybe Bob gives back the one-bit answer they both need to know. But here's a nice example, this media example, where they really have to communicate back and forth for quite some time. Um, so actually in refined models of communication complexity, you can also look at trade-offs between like the number of rounds, where a round is you know, defined by like Alice sending multiple bits or mob Bob sending multiple bits. So it's the number of switches in between who's talking. Um, but we won't get into this refinement today and just like, you know, worry about the total number of bits communicated both ways. Okay, and just to orient you a little, since we know that like every algorithm problem can be solved, you know, in this, this framework, n plus n bits to one bit using like n plus one bits of communication, um, we generally think of, you know, a communication protocols that use polylog n bits as being, you know, efficient, kind of like the analog of P for communication complexity, and uh, um, protocols that use some polynomial number of bits, like, I don't know, linear bits or square root n bits or n to the point one bits as being inefficient. Okay, this is not a perfect dichotomy because, you know, there are um, functions between polylog and uh, n to the epsilon, but you know, most normal problems fit into one of these two categories. And so this is the rough guideline you should have in mind that you're generally trying to strive for polylog n bit uh, protocols, if you can, communication protocols. Okay, so let me tell you actually now the most important uh, communication task in communication complexity. It's the most important one because it's sort of like the three sat of communication complexity in that it's like the canonical hard communication task from which almost all communication complexity lower bounds derive by reduction from this one task. And it's called um, disjointness. It's actually slightly unfortunate that they chose this name, as I'll explain in a moment. But uh, let me say what disjointness is. So again, uh, it's going to map n bits. You know, Alice and Bob get n bit strings, and they have to output one bit. But you think of their strings, little x and y, again, as subsets of the numbers one through n. So think of Alice gets some subset of the numbers one through n, Bob gets some set, uh, subset of the numbers one through n, and their task is to determine if these two subsets are disjoint. You know, they have no element in common. 
And if you want to think about this a bit more like logically or computer science e elite, um, you can really think of it like as follows. You think these two n bit strings x of x and y, and you kind of and them together bitwise. So you do a little and on the bits and pairs. And um, basically in the set theory world, this tells you, you know, n facts about whether or not this number one is in both sets, is number two in both sets, and number three in both sets. And then you or together these results. And once you or together these n results, um, you learn whether the sets are not disjoint, if they have something in common. And then because it's disjointness, you take the not at the end. Okay. It's really unfortunate because like this not at the end is kind of stupid. It makes it like sort of not like an NP complete problem. It makes it like a co NP complete problem. It'd be real great if instead, uh, instead of disjointness, they had chosen like non disjointness or like the property of having intersection. But anyway, they picked disjointness so back in the 80s is like their key problem. And so we got to stick with it. Um, in any case, in communication complexity, at least for what we're going to say today, there's not really much difference because if you can compute a function f, you can compute the negation of the function f with no additional communication. OK, so disjointness uh, is a very important problem in communication complexity. And you can always, you know, again, compute this uh, using n plus 1 bits of communication. And for example, a trivial way with Alice sending her whole set to Bob and Bob um, computing the answer and giving her the one bit answer back. Uh, it's also not hard to show in the deterministic communication complexity model that n plus 1 bits are required. To be honest, the deterministic communica communication complexity model is not super interesting, as, we'll, uh, as I'll say later. Uh, the interesting case is the randomized case. And here, as it turns out, unlike with the equality function, if you, even if you allow Alice and Bob to use a randomized communication complexity, communication protocol, they still need to compute, or com sorry, they still need to communicate a linear number of bits. Okay, so somehow this is like um, still maximally hard even with, even with randomness, okay? And so, you know, this is, uh, um, you know, this exemplar of a really hard uh, communication problem, disjointness. This was first proved by um, Kalyana Sundaram and Schnitger in 1992. And the proof of this is like famously pretty difficult. Uh, so we're certainly not going to prove it in this course. Um, but similarly with 3SAT, right? I mean, once you know this fact and like take it as a given, then many, many um, lower bounds in communication complexity are derived by actually um, reduction from this fact about disjointness. You know, if you want to argue that some problem G is hard, requires a lot of communication, you argue that, well, if there were some efficient communication protocol that could solve G, and by manipulating it a bit, you could get an efficient communication protocol for solving disjointness, but that's known to not exist. Uh, so here's another go-to hard function. Disjointness is an important one, but here's one that's almost as important. It's called the inner product mod 2 function, or IP2 for brevity. And uh, it also maps n bit strings, two n bit strings to one single bit. And what single bit is that? It's um, just the uh, inner product in the field F2. Um, so it's uh, just x dot y, or the, we've written, it can write it this way as well. It's the sum uh, <coughs> mod 2, or the xor, of again these pairwise um, ands of the two strings. <coughs> A third way to look at it, um, as we'll use later in this lecture, if you remember way back to our lecture on analysis of Boolean functions, um, this is basically the same as the um, Fourier character or the Fourier monomial. Uh, Fourier characters are Fourier monomials. So you can think of Alice as getting a string x and Bob is getting a subset s, and then they want to compute this chi s x, which is basically, again, you know, the xor of the bits in x uh, in the subset of positions s. Right? If you think of here of y as indicating a subset s of positions, then this uh, dot product is really just the xor of the bits of x in those positions indicated by y. Okay, so this is another very important um, function to study in communication complexity. <clears throat> 